Oh. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining this Dataversity webinar, The Benefits of a Data Catalog with Built-in Data Lineage, sponsored today by Octopi. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, or excuse me, in the bottom middle of your screen. Or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights of questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just note the Zoom chat defaults to send you just the panelists, but you may absolutely change that to network with everyone. To access the chat or the Q&A panels, you can find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen for those features. Features. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce to you our speakers for today, Nisim Ohayan and John Fry. John is the CEO and Managing Partner at Fintegrity Consulting, LLC, with over 30 years experience across all asset types in both functional and technical aspects of the treasury and capital markets industry. John has been responsible for over 15 major operating model transformation in addition to 35 vendor system implementations and upgrades and over 100 client engagements. He has been the product manager for five world-class FTB full cycle capital markets trading systems. Nisim is the Director of Global Business Development at Octopi and is a longtime professional in sales, business development, and marketing, expertise in establishing the foundations of scalable sales models supported by implementation and a uh, uh, implementation of, excuse me, and execution effective process management and integration into the organization's end-to-end -end management of the customer lifecycle. And with that, I will give the floor to Nisima and John to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Okay, well, thank you very much for that introduction. Wonderful. Let me go ahead and advance to our screen. So here we are. Thanks, Shannon. Uh, let's get started. Um, I'd like to start by just maybe making a statement here that, uh, you know, if we know that knowledge is power and that data is a source of knowledge, then we should all be really superheroes with superpowers. Considering all the amount of data that we generate and consume each day with all of our uh, actions being tracked and digitized, it's really a wonder that there are places to keep all this data. And yet, that data is in de indeed flowing, and quite often it flows very nicely into well-maintained structures from which this data can be accessed for insights. So when BI Survey, the, the one that uh, provided all this, uh, these data points that you're seeing on the screen, when they decided to do this poll, they found from 710 companies, um, they, you would have expected that uh, the companies would have been able to report favorably when they're asked, so you know what percentage of your decisions are data-driven? Well, it seems unfortunately that this is not necessarily the case because for half the companies and in turn half of their decisions, the gut-driven decision is king, uh, especially in companies that are over 55,000 uh, employees, for example, because they found that in their case, it was only 40% of the decisions which were actually driven by data. So there's also you know, companies that were specifically considered to be the most mature in the data infrastructure and the data intelligence systems. Uh, they reported that still only you know, half of their decisions were driven by data. So now that is, or this is the gap that we are looking to explore today, right? So uh, we wanna know what kind of practical steps can organizations take to uh, increase the likelihood that their decisions will be driven by data. Uh, why are decision makers yet uh, not yet really trusting uh, and using the data that's uh, currently in inventory that the IT teams have actually painstakingly put together? And are there any low hanging fruit in terms of some methods, tools, or procedures that can be leveraged to take your organization over the threshold and become more data-driven? So to address this gap, let's sum up some of the uh, challenges that are faced by data professionals whose job it is to consume and present this data uh, to become more, uh, you know, to, for the organization to become more data-driven. So there's obviously the, the BI teams that are, uh, I would say they're drinking from a fire hose. They're just you know, constantly getting so much information and uh, to continue with that analogy, if they're drinking from the fire hose, I would imagine they're probably not thirsty. They're getting lots of data. They're not, uh, they're, not, they're not starving for the data, but the problem is that there's a lot of this data that's going by the wayside. So um, 
it, it, is it a question really of if you build it, they will come? But the reality is that, you know, just because the data is there, it doesn't mean that it will be used, let alone that it should be, that it will be used correctly. Um, there's council, countless initiatives, regulations, strategies, uh, and strategies that add to the demand for and leveraging th that data effectively. Um, when when you add to that the rapid increase of data sources, um, how can a single version of the truth ever become agreed upon? Uh, the workforce the workforce is also quite mobile. You've got people that come in and out of jobs that are, that are moving from company to company, that are moving from different roles in the, inside the company, and now post COVID, um, hopefully we're post COVID, right? <laughs> the, you know, in the post COVID era. Uh, everybody's working from home much more than they ever than they ever used to, and that also has an impact on the ability to uh, to be able to leverage uh, data assets that uh, that used to be you know discussed in person. So the more systems that uh, more systems than ever before, new and emerging technologies and obligations to comply with ever increasing data uh, and data privacy regulations are just a few examples of the load that's being you know kind of hoisted upon the BI and data teams uh, overall. So the data teams are especially the, the ones that are expected to fundamentally transform how decisions are made through all kinds of different, different initiatives. They're modernizing the data stores to ones that are more, that have more control, uh, that are have better visibility. They're the ones that are also um, basically making it uh, um, possible to migrate the data to, intel to new data intelligence systems that are more accessible, more scalable. They're using cloud architecture that can be a mixture of uh, private and public cloud, as well as supporting those uh, legacy on-prem systems that uh, that are you know still keeping the lights on. So they're busily also cataloging all those data assets. They're doing it through all kinds of different means, even Excel, but they're doing it. They're making sure that people have some kind of access to these definitions. Um, and they're doing it in, in a way that uh, they're hoping that the business users will be able to somehow self-serve and consume the data uh, in a more effective way. Uh, they implement and support additional ways to consume the data. Quite often, these actually end up being uh, data science projects where they're looking to gain more insights or use the data through uh, machine learning and AI initiatives. Uh, all the while, like I said, they're trying to keep the lights on and make sure that the traditional reports and dashboards uh, and the marketing use cases are still able to function because that's exactly how the uh, business operates. So with all those initiatives, the, the uh, resource and the resources that are being poured into treating data as a resource, uh, it is a wonder really that uh, you hear of examples of the major disconnect between the providers and consumers of company data. I would add that the, inabil the inability to use data assets that are on hand can actually render them more of a liability than an asset. So what can be done to assist business users um, to better use the data that's already on hand. So I'd like to see if we can il illustrate this with a, with a case study. So John, um, give you a chance to take the mic here and give us a, give us your your thoughts on uh, you know, sure. this that you've been doing for so long, um, even long before you've ever heard of Octopi. Maybe you can share with us a, a, an example of a, one of these projects where you've been involved, where you saw that the lack of visibility and control of the data actually caused the customer to spend a lot more time and money and energy uh, than they should have, uh, should, the, should, you know, would it be that they had done the things according to best practices uh, today? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks, Nessim. Appreciate it. So let's go back to 2008. This is a project I ran for the South Africa Clearer. They'd implemented a system, it's a very complicated system, or at least tried to, use somebody else's database and essentially cobbled the thing together, did it in about two and a half years, and then went live. So you're talking about Clearing Bank, they went live. Four weeks after they went live, they couldn't reconcile anything. Their reports going to the South African Central Bank were all wrong, and um, they had to turn it off basically roll back four weeks, unsettle everything, unclear it, and then redo it with the old system, which obviously was um, not, let's put it this way, it wasn't the best idea at the time. 
So what we did, we came in in September, we looked at it and we said, right, we're obviously missing a few things now. One thing you could do was look at everything coming into the data, 3,000 trades a day from a couple other systems, track it all through, find out where it was going. So we said, nope, that's taking too long. We had five days to come up with a timeline. We said seven months. So as you can read this much faster than I can talk to it, um, the strategy of fix it, that's verbatim. That's exactly what I said to the CTO. We're just going to fix it. So if you flip to the next slide, please listen. So the idea was, let's look at what they were missing, which were the South African Reserve Bank um, reports and all the audit, and then back out from there. What we had to do was do essentially a data lineage and a data catalog manually. So we had four SMEs sitting there looking at the system, dredging data out. Now this system is a hybrid database, it's object relational. So it doesn't actually have a lot of keys in it. You have to know what you're doing. You have to know the API. And we went after the data going back from the reports all the way up to the front and tracking it through. We didn't have to do much of a data catalog because the system data was essentially very simple. It was entities and trades and they were very simple trades and we didn't have to worry about it. What was important was the confidence in the data because clearly um, the spotlight was very much on the project. The South African Reserve was leaning over the shoulder literally every week. They wanted to know what was going on. So we had to invent a data catalog, a couple of new project management tools. We used data extensively for completion of the project. We didn't use um, any kind of normal Gantt charts or anything. We just said, right, data. If the data is good, we're on it. And we did it. And it took, um, we were two weeks early. We left with actually perfect South African Reserve Board uh, reporting, perfect audit. And when we flipped the switch, which was two and a half hours, and it was checked through the rudimentary, and I mean rudimentary, Excel app, Microsoft Access type um, tracking that we'd built, we wound up with zero issues for the next four months. So literally nothing. Through the switch, fine. It just worked. So what the uh, we then we did a post mortem after that we looked at what we should have done what we could have done better and clearly trying to build this thing was not great. Um, we had to do it I don't think there was anything else around at the time, nobody really heard of it, at least not much. But the best we could have done was two weeks sooner, we did it in six and a half months, we could have done it in six if it had been perfect. And um, yeah that was. That was the first one I'd done where it was really hit me in the face that there were sort of two or three things that stood out. One was you had to have a catalog linked to the lineage. Two, you had to get the lineage because people mean different things when they talk about different things. So you need to know exactly where the data comes from. Otherwise, you do throw rubbish out and it goes beyond the system. But this was essentially one system. It wasn't joining up multiple systems, not in the sense of... Uh, full-blown integration. So, and the other one, I guess, was that uh, we, we found out we were using data everywhere. Every single piece of the system implementation, the testing, everything was driven by data. We didn't look at functionality at all. We basically made the assumption that, which was perhaps a bit wild, but we said that the, the vendor, it's a vendor system, had tested the functionality reasonably well. We needed to make sure the data was good. So we went after that and it worked, worked very well. It was actually at that time, which was uh, 15 years into what I've been doing. It's the only project in this space that at that time been done under budget, under time, and we got it right, um, we as a team. So, so that's the Brilliant. sort of summary of that one. Brilliant. So you really did it based on making sure that the, the, the data was, was healthy and that you were able to see yeah. visibly uh all of the dead assets connecting with each other and understanding how that flow was working that was the mm -hmm. primary thing and you just trusted that the, the system could take the data the way it was designed to yeah i mean but basically i looked at the database so i was i knew the database um I, I mean this was lucky i designed that thing so i knew it but i knew it cold which is i guess another lesson is get somebody in who knows the system if you're dealing with a vendor system 
But um, yeah, it took two months of raw SQL to to line the data up and make sure there were no errors anywhere. So that was um, it was intense. It was a great project actually. We still talk about it as one of the best. Great, wonderful. So yeah, so it really does sound like that was a successful implementation and an important way for the com for the bank to really pivot towards having better uh, management of their data uh, through better visibility and uh, cataloging things uh, as tightly as possible and being able to connect to, to the lineage, which is really what we're talking about today. So why don't we unpack a little bit about, uh, you know, some of the key capabilities that we recommend to, to focus on. So the first one, of course, is, yeah, you really do need to focus on you know, the automation. Uh, nowadays, there's so much more automation than in the days that you were working on this before. So, uh, you know, ideally, you want to stop doing this kind of thing manually. Uh, try to make sure that uh, you, you know that the system can actually uh, continuously uh, be scanned for updates and get that information into the lineage. Uh, it doesn't mean that, uh, you know, just because you have a system that ha that can map lineage, uh, the question is, are you doing that ma that mapping manually or is this gonna happen automatically? If you're doing it manually, you can pretty much assume that the users are not gonna trust it so much because it typically isn't gonna kept, be kept up to date regularly. So the goal here obviously is to make sure that the, the, the data will be used. So that's uh, that's the first uh, first point. Uh, the next one is to make sure that it's democratized in terms in 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 the sense that uh, let everybody contribute to the enrichment of the metadata, right? You want the business users as well as the data uh, the data engineers or architects or whatever titles they're using nowadays. You want to make sure that all these uh, different uh, stakeholders really in the data uh, landscape are able to add their 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 thoughts, and it doesn't mean just that they're able to but you actually create an environment where they are, it's natural for them to do so. So be sure that all the relevant data citizens have access to all the relevant data that they need, and then encourage collaboration, uh, create a centralized portal so that the discussion about the assets doesn't happen in another channel somewhere else in Teams or Slack or email or you know at the coffee uh, in, in the coffee room or whatever. You want to make sure that when somebody asks a question about, hey, how's this calculation done? Does this actually have uh, uh, um, you know tax included or whatever the questions might be about around the data? Those questions need to be placed right there where the where the consumers for the data are actually going to be uh, ready to use it, and that way. When somebody leaves the company, that information doesn't leave with them as well. So they've actually now become part of that it then becomes part of the tribal knowledge in the organization. And finally, of course, traceability, which ultimately really is the lineage. Um, you want to make sure that BI teams are able to self-serve, but really they're not going to unless they know for a fact that the data that they're con that they're about to consume is the data that they are comfortable to say that they're ready to commit to that data set. Uh, and the data teams on the other side, on the more technical or data engineer side, if I, if I can call them that, um, they need to know that they can see what would be impacted if they make a change to something, because that's their job, is that they need to maintain these data pipelines. These flows has to have to really connect with each other and they have to understand exactly why they're connecting them to each other. So making sure that that actually works uh, means that the uh, the data teams that are making those changes, they need to know what's upstream of this uh, asset. How did I, like, why am I working on this asset? And then before I make a change, I need to know where should I look for any potential impact. And that brings us to our second case study with you, John. Um, so you've got these capabilities in mind, hopefully. Let's hear about another one of your uh, <laughs> amazing big projects where you were involved. And specifically, I'd be pleased if you could share with us, you know, how this project presented a real deep challenge and how you solved it with, uh, you know, the creation of the data catalog, making sure everybody's, uh, you know, talking from the same language, talking the same language or singing from the same uh, hymn sheet, if you will. Uh, and that uh, they've, uh, you know, been able to leverage some form of automation or data collection or, you know, metadata collection, especially, uh, and how you provided that uh, visibility from uh, source to target. Sure. Okay, this was an entirely different um, 
case altogether. I mean, in 2008, the issue we had was the bank and the vendor said, panic, go. We don't care what you do, fix it, which was great. This one, not at all. Very political. Um, lots of different managerial silos, which you run into in, in organizations, big or small. So the thing here was, you know, as you can see, there's um, a big industry change, impacts a lot of financial instruments, a lot of the banks working uh, processes, everything else. So the bank turned around and said, well, we're going to change this. And we have these front end systems of the three massive systems. And we want to know what the impact is all the way back through the bank. A couple of things immediately jump out. One is that the new thing that was replacing the old thing was different only in real data, not in naming of data, not anything else. The other one was that you were dealing with at least five different worldviews. Um, and when you hear provenance, I was thinking about this, there's a couple of things. One is that, you know, how the data trend moves through an organization right now, one into the other. The other one is the meaning of the data moving across time as new people come in. And, and we're talking about um, IT staff turnover through the roof on some of these systems. They're like an instant masters in let's get a, a rise when you've touched the system. So the terminology changes, it has changed. And some of these things were very old, 20 years old. So we're trying to transfer, traverse all of that to find, okay, where is this thing used? How's it changing? What are we gonna do with it? But again, in common with the other example was pick something that maximizes the value and hit it really hard. Don't try and do everything. You cannot boil the ocean. There's too much data. You know, one of these systems has a, a trade report that if you want, will give you 16,000 columns. You can't map that. It's, in, well, you could, but it's, um, it's difficult. They also had different database structures. Again, one was the same system as before, object relational kind of database. So hybrid, the only way you get at that legally, according to the, the um, contracts is via the API. So we had to wait, make a way we wrote code literally to translate the API that the customer had used into views on data. So flipping it that way and then looking at what they'd done and tracking it through using uh, terms, literally. I, I say English language, I mean, it happened to be in America, it was English language. So we had to follow that through. And then we did need a data catalog, extensive. Um, I wrote 1200 terms myself, it took a while. Um, I think that pointed out the had a lot of debates with a lot of the users about what things meant and constantly looking at the dictionary, constantly looking at the legal terms because they're all based on legal documents. And it took a lot of um, time to persuade users that things they had referred to as A for years actually did not mean what they thought or didn't mean what it literally said. So that was huge. And then we wound up with a system that to some extent ran through their processes automatically to the extent that we could get out the code, get out the database, join words or commonly used abbreviations for dates like D-A-T-E, D-T, D-A-T, if it has got underscores in a term, stripping that out with code to put it in a database and then say, right, we can now start to track things. We also found that a lot of this is very complicated. So when you're talking about this, it's not, it's pricing. It's not just um, put a piece of data in a record or a report. It's actually used for pricing the instruments. It's used for risk. It's used for everything. Issuing bank loans, commercial loans, it goes all the way through. So when we did that, we thought, okay, how are we going to do this? How are we going to put some kind of boundary around if it's reasonable or not? So we settled on units number one, and that is great. You can get to your units, you can get to your calculations, you can get the lineage for that. What gets super interesting is when you're trying to put boundary points around reasonableness, because now you're roping in extra pieces of data because you need to know, okay, this is the number, but this is its boundary and you have to bring in extra data. So how do you do that? So we made some assumptions and we used, again, our knowledge, series of SMEs, about three of us and a team, to rip through the databases and say, we know what this should be. It should be within this range and that's governed by these other pieces of data. Let's roll them in. 
and you come up with approximations was the best way I can put it. So we could go around and say, this is where you use this thing. These are the boundaries it should have. If you got it wrong, it's this. If you got it right, it's that. And try and track that through. We did five systems, I would say pretty well. Um, and they, all, they were different types, so that was good. One was very, very mathematical. The other one was very old, denormalized mainframe. And then you had the one in the middle, which was object relational and very cutting edge. So we were able to establish where those things were used, where LIBOR was used, where it was going to be replaced, and how. So the bank could then go off to their legal department and say, these are all the contracts we need to remediate. These are the reports we need to change. This is the code we need to change. Well, guess what? The engineers, they don't know what they're actually dealing with. People think they do. They don't. You're looking at sharp end finance. They Nobody's taught them that. They're sort of up to object modeling, but they don't know finance. So this was a way of really presenting that information. Here's finance. Here's the lineage. Here's the catalog. Learn. That was a huge benefit for them. Okay. Was there anything from this slide? Because I didn't advance the slide. Uh, just wondering if there's anything else that you wanted to uh, yeah, you bring can, out here. I think there's um, no. That's that's about it. I think that's pretty much what you just no, mentioned. And yeah, based on the pretty solution. much. Yeah, agile. Whoa, there's a big one. Everybody waves the flag on that. You got to watch it. Point with agile is it's backwards driven. You get user requirements. It pushes you forward. Perhaps they call it a product owner. You don't need a product owner with this. You need a product manager. Somebody has to have the vision of saying, we are going there and I will steer this to the point I already know. Well, you know what the point is because you have SMEs, you have experts in the domain, in data, more in the domain than anything, but object modeling was a huge thing um, than just an agile project manager. Scrum was fine. You have to generate value immediately. Otherwise people don't believe you can do it. But you notice that both these cases were not decision points. They were correcting things that were wrong. And I found that a lot is that people talk about firms making decisions on data. They don't. Fundamentally, they don't. They make decisions on cheapness and on money and politics. And, you know, can we build something rather than buy it? That's the universal thing. They want to build all the time. They don't want to buy stuff because they've got bunches of engineers hanging around that want to build things. Do not build this. Do not. This is very hard. Conceptually, it's hard. Um, curating it is where you want to put the knowledge and the investment of time and everything else is curating the data catalog, looking after the lineage and getting those two things working together so you can establish confidence in the meaning of the data. Maybe the values, if you can get that far, you can. If you can, great. But the meaning of the data and the lineage together they're linked completely linked and you they both feed off each other in terms of how confident are we that that lineage works as confident as you should be based on how accurately you, you described it so those two that was the thing with this particular project was was joining the dots on that that was i guess the next layer for me anyway that's great i think that what you're saying about the curation is that it's an ongoing process, right? I mean, you don't come up and say, "Okay, so here's what we're going to call everything." It's it's a, it's a mm. it's an interaction between those that are kind of the purveyors of the data versus those that are consumers of it. Well, kind of, but um, it's kind of like a dictionary, right? You don't give the Oxford English Dictionary out and say, "Here, um, amend that as you see fit," because you give it five years, it'll be junk. Actually, about a week. So. <laughs> You need a gateway, you need a workflow, you need people who are going to sit there. It's, it's like sort of having a super um, rigid wiki where you're saying, yeah, we will take your suggestions, we will consider them, but you are a user, you are not used to doing object modeling. You don't know how to express yourself. And they don't, it's not their fault, they're not been told. But you have to take it and somebody who can think about this, yeah, completely objectively, to then put it in the catalog and say, that is the same as something else. And we're going to write that accurately. We're going to look at the definitions and we're going to have time to do that. And it's rigid is not what you want, but it's got to be extremely sticky. Otherwise, as soon as you tweak one of the meanings, your entire lineage changes Good and you point. run the risk of breaking all of it. Good point. 
All right, great. Well, that's uh, that's excellent. So uh, what I'd like to do here is just summarize a little bit of what we've uh, covered so far. Um, you know, there's a bunch of reasons that, I, that we believe that it's absolutely critical to make sure that lineage and catalog functions be tightly integrated or indeed uh, become uh, part of the same solution. So firstly, staying up to date. Uh, it's a major undertaking to build a data catalog. Anybody who's uh, on the call has been involved in that. I would imagine that uh, uh, you're probably nodding your heads, but uh, it's actually going to be exponentially more uh, of, a, of a challenge if you are doing it from uh, uh, from the from the catalog after finding out the lineage from another source. So providing that together and keeping it always up to date is a pretty, uh, you know, kind of central uh, message that we're, that we're making here. Uh, doing this manually is an exercise truly in uh, design and futility. I mean, you're basically uh, constantly cry trying to keep the inventory up to date, trying to map the, the lineage to, to different assets. Uh, it's always going to be out of date by the time you actually update the uh, these things if they're if it's done manually. Um, and uh, for the data catalog and the data lineage uh, mapping to be trusted, you really uh, do want to make sure that um, that it is uh, always kept current. Um, another point is that it's uh, you know the full visibility of the data journey. For that, you, you really have to be able to de demonstrate that each asset has its story and non-technical users will need to know specific information about that uh, that data asset. So they're going to need to know, you know, where does it come from? Can I actually trust it? Is it up to date? What can I learn from it? Is it approved by a data owner for actual use in, 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 in the business? Or am I taking a chance by saying, oh yeah, this one looks like the right one and I'm not absolutely sure that, uh, that somebody else has actually investigated it. So as a business user, I don't necessarily have that uh, the access to that kind of information or really uh, the training to really go that far into the depth of the uh, the understanding of the asset. So uh, when planning a change uh, or or making or fixing a problem in a data flow, uh, the data engineers and architects and the, and the like, they need to be able to know what's upstream and downstream of this asset. What's what are the dependencies? Uh, so that I can go ahead and make the change with confidence that I know exactly where I need to to, to check for, for the potential impact so that I can uh, make sure that if I'm fixing something, I didn't break, you know, 10 other uh, assets down the, or reports down the, down the road. Okay. Um, the lineage also needs to be able to uh, provide visibility across multiple platforms. You can't, you can't depend on each tool to provide its own lineage because the data doesn't flow inside of just one tool at a time. It flows across tools. We buy systems that are, you know, from different vendors and expect to be able to use that system to, you know, extract from one system and load it to another system. And then you've got uh, views and tables that are coming from different uh, environments, uh, whether they're on-prem on or in the cloud. All of these things are crossing all kinds of different uh, infrastructures. So you need to be able to cross multiple boundaries in terms of vendors, in terms of uh, architecture, whether it's on-prem cloud, whether it's cloud of your own, your private cloud, or is it a public cloud, cloud as well? And to include a, the uh, the lineage, uh, you really do need to be able to uh, to have a single unified view of all of those data flows. And finally, like you were saying, making sure that the uh, uh, that the definitions are absolutely clear and that they're you know you can't fudge them. You need to be able to uh, to then uh, get that conversation into a single place where the conversation is happening around these assets and maintain that tr that tribal knowledge over time, because uh, there's you know lots of. Uh, uh, lots of change going on in terms of the people and what the roles are. So we need to encourage the discussion alongside the very place where the assets are actually being consumed. And that's obviously uh, the data catalog. Uh, and we need to simplify the enrichment of, uh, of the metadata by creating a single place for the technical and business users to collaborate and uh, do that effectively. So with that, um, I'd like to just give you guys this, uh, a quick little demonstration as to what we're talking about. Um, oh, let's go ahead and jump in. Okay. So I'm gonna 
do this real quick and just to give you a context as to, you know, yes, it's possible. So let's illustrate it through a, a little scenario to illustrate how important it is and how easy it is really to have the data catalog and uh, the, the lineage directly integrated with each other. And we'll begin with a business user. Uh, she, her name is Holly in this example, um, and uh, she's researching a data asset and she wants to understand the business term. So she goes in and decides to start at the, in the data catalog where she'll actually see uh, a full cross-section of data assets, but that would be the, uh, the data owners that are gonna be managing all of this. But as a business user, she might go in and say, okay, so I'm looking for something relating to cost. So if I'm searching the data catalog, I'm first gonna come up with, uh, well, in this case, 72 assets that are, uh, that are gonna be linked to the word cost. But uh, these are, they look a lot like technical assets. They're columns, they're uh, calculations, they're all kinds of different things. So I'm going to go ahead and remove all the ones except for the business glossary terms, because as a business user, that's really what interests me. And now I've removed everything else, and we should be able to get our result here. Total product cost, which I also has the flag of approved. So as I click into that, we can now see that as a business user, I can already see the business glossary term the description has been given. We can also have a calculation description. We can also see that that, that is owned by Holly, okay? Now, in this example, Holly might want to know a little bit more. Like, for example, in this case, what is this term linked to? What other assets are actually linked to this asset? And we can scroll through and see there's a whole bunch of them here, but one of them also has the flag of approved. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. And now we can see that we have an, uh, a column in Power BI. It's got a, uh, a description, a general description, a technical description, and even a calculation. And you can see that there's three, uh, three, uh, three columns here that are being used in this calculation. So Holly decides, okay, I wanna do a little bit more investigation. Who owns this asset? So it's Sophia. I'm gonna ask Sophia a question. I wanna understand, is this exchange rate um used as of the as of the order date and before uh, sophia can answer sophia is probably going to want to do a little bit of digging herself so sophia comes uh she, she gets tagged and that information uh, th that tag obviously is going to create a, a notification in that notification she'll come to this uh this page where this uh, 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 that she'll be able to do start her investigation, and she'll probably go straight to the lineage to understand. Okay, so what exactly is this asset that she's asking about? And we can see right away that this is the total product cost that we've been, we've asked about. It comes from a report called Total Product Sales, and if we look at the entire landscape uh, from the point that it came in from the business application, we can see those three columns that are used in the calculation and how they transform inside the ETL. The, the business application was uh, was accessed through the ETL, and then it, uh, it transforms along the way. And you can follow it all the way through until you get down to your report, okay? Again, this is just really high level. We wanted to give you an understanding that, first of all, we were looking at at this at the, at the uh, column level going across all systems. But I might want to do a little bit more of a dig into this and see what are the systems themselves without worrying so much necessarily about the actual uh, column. Now I'm kind of zooming out a little bit and looking only at the systems that are involved. And here you can see a little bit of a picture of the different uh, systems that are providing data to this, to this report. So that's how quickly you're able to get to the lineage. You don't need to do uh, a long research and, in, uh, and, and, and finding of all this information through all kinds of queries and opening tickets with all the different data system asset, uh, owners. You basically get this information immediately because, again, it's all kept in one repository, which is giving you the ability to really quickly go to the, uh, to the answer without having to do a lot of research. So we now have this information. We can see, by the way, anywhere that you're seeing a shade here, it tells us we can continue to go upstream from these ETLs. We can go downstream as well from these different, uh, uh, from these different assets. There's three more dependencies uh, on top of that. But basically, we, all, we already know now all of the systems that are providing data to this report. Okay, now if I want to go deeper into this report, I can go into the inner system lineage. And now this is the third level of lineage. This is basically what we're talking about when we're talking about three, three levels of lineage. We're giving you kind of a three dimensional view, if you will. 
okay? And total product cost is down here. It's one of the columns in this report, right? But there's a bunch of other columns. And over here, you can even see that if there's a calculation or if there's some kind of code in here, we can double click on that and we can actually now even go straight to the code. We don't need to go to the Power BI system to see that code. We can actually see it right here to understand what exactly is the transformations going on inside of the report itself. And at this point, then, uh, let's say that uh, Sophia is satisfied. She now has an answer to the question as to how this calculation is done. She wants to go back to the data catalog and bring that back to uh, to give an answer. And she comes in here and she says, yeah, the US, uh, the US dollar exchange rate is calculated as of the order date. Okay, so based on that quick quick review, she's pr uh, would would say probably saved quite a bit of time in terms of being able to get to the uh, to the answer that she's looking for. So hopefully that gives you a high level understanding that uh, yes, these things are possible to do. Uh, it's quite easy once you've got the the kind of tools that that are available today. Uh, and uh, at this point, I think that we're probably ready to get ready for a, a summary of today's session and maybe getting uh, some questions. If you have any, uh, be happy to to, uh, to field some questions with, uh, with John here. Thank you so much. And John, thank you so much. Uh, just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day uh, Thursday for this webinar Pacific time with links to the slides, links to the recording and anything else requested throughout here. We've got a couple of questions coming in in the Q&A section. Um, would you say data lineage can be used to incrementally build a data catalog by letting users first link potential duplicates and subsequently eliminate them once confirmed, such as with stakeholders? Yeah, I think it's a good idea. I think that's, that's what we did. I think the, the danger is to um, assume that stakeholders who may be the people who use the data the most actually know what it means. Um, you're looking at, uh, again, it's the object models because most people don't get into behavior and a lot of the data names, the data use is behavior. So, yeah, but that's exactly what we did in the second project was to really sort of open the doors and say, hey, you know, throw us what you think, we'll curate that and we'll feed that back. And um, it allows people to pick up on their own misunderstandings, defend their point of view, debate. And um, you get a lot more confidence in the uh, the definitions and therefore the lineage. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's definitely the case. And um, but uh, I'm just going to clarify from the perspective of uh, you know when you're using automation like we do at, at Octopi, you're able to do them both kind of simultaneously. I mean, basically the uh, the uh, the way it works is that um, the 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 metadata is uh, is is scanned and, and collected and uploaded to the to the central metadata store uh, and that means then that you have it all in one place um, so we already uh, from the moment that you've uh, implemented octopi uh, we've already collected all the data assets into the data catalog but there's not much information on them other than what's available in metadata uh, out of the system sometimes it's good sometimes it's not but uh incrementally you're right uh over time as you start to uncover what are the source of target implications of this asset versus that one? You start to document that as you go along. So obviously, as you're working, the goal is always document, document, document. Don't wait until too late, until it's much later. You see something, document it right away. So that's yeah, definitely the case in that sense. How I'm looking at. Can, oh yeah. yeah. Go ahead. No, no, How go fast ahead. can Octopi generate auto-generate metadata on a system? So Octopi's process is actually quite simple. Um, we provide a uh, an agent, and basically it's a Windows application. It goes into the VPN inside of the company's environment, um, and it's uh, configured to go out to the metadata systems that uh, that are uh, in the customer's environment. So it'll go out and you know collect from uh, data stage, uh, SSIS. Uh, uh, Really, I mean, you can get the, the supported out of the box technologies from our website, but basically um, you just run that client, which we will configure for the customer. Uh, you run that client and pretty much the the effort can take it anywhere from an hour to a half a day. Uh, it's really not a project per se. It's more kind of like a task. Just configure the tool, run it. Um, 
it'll produce it'll produce a local set of files that uh, you'll probably want to have infosec take a look at before you go ahead and upload that. Most likely, that's a process that you need to to, to get uh, uh, approval. So they're going to look at it and they're going to see there's only metadata in there. So you'll get the green light. Go ahead and upload that, and then uh, within 24 to 48 hours. Uh, to answer your question at last, that's all it takes. Basically, it's a one hour effort to let's say half a day effort at most on your end uh, and about uh, 24 to 48 hours from the uh, processing side on our end. Nice. So are metadata scans based on connectors or size of data assets? Yeah, I mean, basically we have a, 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 a are quite a large uh, list of connectors that are uh, that are pre-configured inside of the Octopi client, um, and uh, these are, as we call it, uh, supported out of the box. So that means that we've actually done the homework, uh, quite uh, intensive work, to understand exactly how those metadata systems are structured, where the where we need to collect the metadata, what kind of user we need as an access to, to that metadata uh, section to be able to collect that. Uh, and then once we get it, we we need to know exactly how to uh, how to parse that information and run it in order to be able to uh, use that code to render the answers to the questions as to so how does this connect to that and what happened in between what is that code that that converted this uh, you know these three columns into uh, into one column. So um, a lot of questions about the product here, which I love. So can Octopi handle the creation of self-defined metadata during a scan? Um, for example, if John is the steward of all the data in the sales schema, can he be tagged as a steward for those data assets in the metadata? I'm actually looking for the question because I didn't quite understand it. Uh, looking for the question in the chat. Yeah, I have it sort of. Oh, there by, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, can Octopi handle the creation of self-defined metadata during a scan? For example, if John is the steward of all the data and in the sales schema, can he be tagged as the steward for those data assets in the metadata? So, uh, I'm going to say yes, but uh, I'm going to presume that that's probably there's probably more to peel that onion but uh um first of all the metadata that uh, that we that we collect from the systems is automatically collected and obviously we include that but uh, as you saw in the data catalog there was a number of things that you could go in uh, there's a pencil i didn't point that out but anyway there's a pencil mark in the uh in in some of these data uh in some of these uh, uh, areas where you can go ahead and enhance the metadata. So yeah, it's a combination of the uh, machine uh, collected metadata as well as the stuff that you can actually continue to uh, enhance. And certainly, yes, you can tag users as the steward, as the owner, um, and you can tag the, the metadata also with all kinds of different descriptors in order to be able to find find data more quickly. And Octopi was the solution used in both case studies that you presented, John? I can answer that, no. <laughs> John, is, <laughs> John is an expert in, 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 in the challenge, but uh, we have uh, we only met recently, and uh, when he was talking about uh, his previous projects, I said, wow, I, I want you to tell us, I want you to tell your story. <laughs> no, I've seen, a, you know what, I've, I've seen a whole bunch of questions, so I'm going to, um, I just want to put away because um, yeah, it's just uh, all of them coming in. Okay, so number one, is it fun? Uh, depends. Um, I've been around for 46 years in finance. For me, the challenge of defining things is sort of fun at first and then it's teaching people and that's fun. And then it gets to the sort of carry on and do it. Um, can you do it automatically? I don't, to some extent, um, if you're talking about derived terms, I do it somewhat automatically with meanings with um you know what things are actually doing but you are boy it gets into a building a dictionary of your world so that's not it's very hard to, to automate that and i think as far as roi goes um yeah it's it's actually pretty easy because there's a couple of ways of looking at it one is um you know what can i do with the data which is one way and the other the other way of looking at it is what happens to me if I get it wrong? 
What happens if your audit's wrong? What happens if your regulatory reporting's wrong? What happens if your so-and-so's wrong? And you're really looking at making sure it isn't wrong, that people actually do get the right data through, that you can identify when it's incorrect, when you've got out of boundary conditions and you can put a stop before you report that to somebody. Um, size of the projects compared to the cost of the tools. Yeah, I mean, that's again, depends how big your project are, projects are. I could do one system, it's, it would easily qualify just for this tool, just for the system implementation alone, let alone anything else, because I've seen how horrible they get. Um, so, I mean, think about it this way, right? Most, inf most uh, certainly financial organizations, they spend 8% of the revenue on their IT budget, 50% of that's on, you know, run the business, just BAU, uh, then 25% more is supposed to be on enhancements. All those go so far over budget, 60%, I think, you look at the Standish report, you know, the collision stuff, 60% over budget, all the R&D clean out the window. 8% of the financial institution's revenue, that is a big number. That's a lot of dollars. So when you come down to how much do you need to do or what value do you need to show to hit an ROI of four when most, most projects are negative, it's pretty easy. If you bring an implementation down from, you know, 60% over to 20% over due, it's a massive, massive improvement. And a lot of it's testing, a lot of it's um, data integrity, a lot of it's, you know, knowing that the report's right. As I said, I've got one report with 16,000 columns. Okay, go find something that says, let's put all these different products with the same column in this one lineup. And they're all different departments, all different people, different histories in the market, different knowledge. There's no way they'll come up with the same various, you know, pieces of data from the same products to wind up with a total. They couldn't even add them up. So yeah, you get ROI pretty, pretty easily as long as you keep it focused. If you try and boil the ocean, forget it you're dead. But if you use a tool and you go after things that you've identified beforehand are, you know, bang for the buck, then yeah, you'll, you'll get the value. Absolutely. And just, you know, uh, and Nissim, do you have anything to add? We get that question a lot, you know, how do you present the value or ROI on a solution like this? How do you, how do you get the buy off? So I think that one of the main things that, uh, that we've experienced at Octopi is that typically these kind of tools are purchased when there's a major event, like uh, migration, mergers and acquisitions, uh, anytime that there's I mean, any, uh, any large amount of change. Because frankly, the way that things are operating for the most part, uh, if they've been doing it manually forever and uh, nothing big is changing right away. So they'll continue to do it manually, even if it's uh, you know somewhat painful, but they, they get used to it and the expectations aren't that you're gonna turn around and, you know, give an answer to a specific uh, challenge uh, that uh, that somebody comes up with and says, oh, uh, I have a report that broke. So that's, that takes a week, it takes a month, it takes a certain amount of time to, to resolve. But once you get into a situation where, well, you know, we plan to go live by a certain date and um, figure out a way to, to manage that impact, that is the typically the the the, um, the scenario where they're going to look at it and say, okay, well, we need some we need some help to figure out where that impact is going to be because we're going to be changing a ton of stuff. So how do we actually do that? So typically, that's the uh, you know kind of the event driven uh, scenarios where people will think about a, a tool like this. Uh, that's not to say that you know there's no value in a tool like this for. Uh, for an everyday kind of use and improving improving systems, but typically when they're as as they're looking for an ROI, it's going to mean reducing the effort to get to the point where we can actually go live and not have the noise. You want to quiet go live. You want to know exactly where to search for the uh, for the potential impact, what to test, and what specifically you don't need to test, and where to look for the impact, and where not to waste time looking for the impact. So. Nisam, there's a lot of questions here on product comparisons, how you compare to other data catalogs. We are a vendor neutral company. Of course, we don't allow putting down other companies, but I, I know, but <laughs> just, uh, <kidding. laughs> you know, just as we wouldn't allow anyone to put down Octopi, right? Of course. So, um, but what competitive advantages, I like the way this was phrased, you know, what competitive advantages does Octopi have? Like what sets you apart from other data catalogs? Um. 
I would say that the first part is that the lineage is integrated with it. And that's a, obviously the title of today's session. And that's really at the end of the day, um, one of the main differentiators because Octopi's data catalog, um, you know, it's a great tool. It's got all the, you know, the, the important features in there. But the number one thing that sets it apart from everything else is the fact that you can go straight to the lineage and it's always, uh, you know, available. Secondly, it's automated. It's actually already created as a result of that one hour to half a day effort. You now have a data catalog. So you just basically upload the, the, the metadata to the, to the Occupy cloud and that's it. 48 hours later, you come back and it's ready for you. Now, obviously there's additional work that needs to be done in terms of you know, adding your your own descriptions and uh, and and you know, creating your data, your 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 glossary and so on. But the fact is that those uh, uh, the effort of collecting the metadata into one place uh, creates the ability for us to not only create the the catalog, but also creating all those views, everything that you saw in that mapping of the lineage and how those interact with each other and the connectivity with all the different sources. That's all done automatically. This is this is not something that somebody went in and said, "Oh yeah, so I've got this asset and I think it connects to that." Let me let me represent. No, that's not the way it works. It's actually all fully automated. So those are the main two differentiators. I would say that you know it's also kind of one of those low hanging fruit kind of tools. It's not an expensive tool, um, and it really does have uh, the ability to to be a very you know tactical tool when you are struggling with uh, a lot of change or you're planning to make some change, you wanna make sure that you can actually manage that very quickly. All right, we've got just four minutes left. I'm gonna slip in as many questions as I can here, at least one more. Um, what are the key tools used to search the data catalog, such as tags, topics, keywords? Is there a combination of automatically generated tags and tags with tagging rules defined by data stewards? Um, well, I guess the the, Tags are user generated, right? So they're the ones that are tagging it based on their use case. So uh, those are uh, individually at the, uh, uh, added. Um, so you could set up a, a workflow for your business to to decide exactly who gets to tag and uh, what kind of tags to you know you're you're approving, so that it can, becomes a uh, kind of an agreed upon uh, methodology. But uh, searching through the, the metadata, you can search by looking for a column name, you can search by looking for a report name, you can search by looking for a calculation. So if you're making a change, uh, as in John's example, if you know that there's LIBOR mentioned in the, in, in, the, in, the in the code, search for LIBOR and you'll find every asset that has the word LIBOR in the calculation, in the name, in the, uh, in the view, in the, in, in the column, all of those are, are gonna come up. And is there a batch mechanism to keep data lineage up to date? Yeah, basically, uh, once the uh, InfoSec team, generally the way it works is once the InfoSec team has uh, inspected that the process only collects metadata, then they go ahead and improve it. And the uh, the data team then just creates a scheduler that automatically uploads the metadata. Typically, what they do uh, is they'll upload it on a Friday and then they'll come back on Monday and they have a, a fresh updated metadata uh, connectivity graph with all the updated metadata inside. Okay, I think I can slip in one more here. After the automate uh, metadata scan from the system, how accurate is the final result? Do we need human assistance to confirm the result? We find that our results are pretty darn accurate. Um, there's obviously some areas that uh, uh, customers will point out to us and we've got teams that uh, immediately jump in on that, but. Uh, the customers are telling us that they are absolutely impressed with the fact that they can actually really rely on on the on the results. Uh, they're not questioning it quite quite uh, quite to the contrary. That is perfect. Well, thank you so much to both of you for this great uh, presentation. I'm going to if I yeah. can, I'm going to answer one more question. I just saw a question that I think would be important to answer. Um, the question is: Is there an integrated data quality component? So first of all, once you know lineage for the uh, for the pipeline, you're actually considerably improving the amount of the the, the level of quality that's available uh, for for understanding. But if you're looking for data quality in terms of sampling the data, 
it's important to note that Octopi only collects metadata and we don't actually see the data whatsoever. That is important because uh, InfoSec quite often will uh, really slow down the, the process in terms of an implementation if they see that there's any kind of data going to the cloud. So uh, we partner with companies that do offer uh, uh, data quality solutions, but we don't do, we don't do that ourselves. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. That brings us right to the top of the hour. Thank you both so much for this great presentation. Uh, and thanks to all our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. Just again, reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of the day, Thursday Pacific time with links to the slides and links to the recording from today. Thank you all. I hope you all have a great day. Thanks to Octopi. Thanks, everybody. And thank you, John. Thank you, everyone. Great to have you.